He told me when they, when they clap, that's when I come out. And I was like, they're not really going to clap, but you guys did. That's pretty awesome. I actually got some clapping. It's good that you got that out of the way before you actually hear me speak. You know, you just <laughs> get the like, oh, this is great. And then afterwards, then you don't have to worry about, you know, clapping again. <laughs> like you said, my name's Charles, and I'm here to tell you some stories. I want to share some stories from Jesus' life. And uh, hopefully just apply that to our year coming up. We're at a time of the year where, um, you know, coming through Thanksgiving and Christmas, this is a time of year where it's really easy to, to remember things we're thankful for and kind of look at the year past and just kind of have a nice overview, right? We, we kind of look at what, what has already happened and for some of us we're like, kind of want to forget <laughs> 2015 and move on to a new year. Some of us are grateful for things that have happened in 2015 uh, but ultimately, what I think is, is great about this time of year is that we really just, we become in a good state of mind to start just giving thanks for good reason. I mean, we just celebrated the birth of our Savior. What better thing to be thankful for, am I right? And, and so we have those things that are just kind of in our head, and we're thinking about it, and it's just a natural time of year to think that way. And then going into the new year, we start thinking, okay, how can I change? How can I make 2016 even better and my challenge to you today is that in order to make 2016 better, I want you to hold on to that thankfulness all year long. And, and in order to do that, I thought it would be really cool to look through a couple stories from Jesus' life and times that he gave thanks. Because I feel like if we look at when Jesus gave thanks, then we get a pretty good idea of when we should give thanks. And then if we keep that in our mind throughout the whole year of 2016 that I move in a bad spot. Sorry. <laughs> and if we hold that throughout the 2016 year, I feel like we could have just a better year. I feel like our lives could just be better if we ourselves just kind of hold on to a mindset of being grateful and giving thanks during different times of the year. And so I'm going to pray before we even dive in, and then, uh, and then we'll dive in. So let's pray. God, I come before you humbled that I get the chance to talk to your people here today. And God, I pray that you would speak through me, uh, give me your words to say, not, not Charles, but speak your words. It's your name I pray. Amen. So, the first story I want to tell you, um, I, I'm not much for just standing up here and reading something. Uh, you'll notice that I'll, I'll move around a little bit, and I hope that's okay. And uh, I, what I would love to do is, if you wanted to turn here and kind of follow along in case you were bored with me, that's the bad spot, right there. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> so if you wanted to open up and kind of follow along, or if you got bored with me and just kind of wanted to read by yourself, that'd be fine too. Um, and so I'll give you kind of a, just a, a chapter that we're going to be in, but I'm not going to read through that word by word. I'm just going to tell you where that is so that you can find it. And then I would love to just tell you this story. And my assumption is that some of you have heard these stories before and that some of you have not. And either way, I hope that you'll open your mind up to hear them in a brand new way today. Because um, these are stories from Jesus' life. Some of us have heard these uh, around. If you've been around here for a while, you've probably heard these preached on before. And I really encourage you just to kind of put yourself aside and hear it as a fresh story. So this first one is in Matthew 14. And it's a pretty cool story. And this is a moment where Jesus stops. It's the bad spot. Jesus stops and gives thanks when basic needs are met. And he gives a really cool story that happens here because this is the feeding of the 5,000. And this is a story we've heard before. We know this story. There's fish and there's bread and Jesus breaks it apart and feeds a bunch of people. And it's pretty cool. So let me tell you what actually happens here. Jesus gets all ready, he's working through his ministry, and he decides he needs some private time. And Jesus never gets private time. Every time he decides that he's going to have some time to himself and just kind of decompress, people follow him because he's Jesus, he's awesome. They want to be around him, they want to be near him, they want him to speak to them. And uh, we often think, man, if Jesus was here, we'd be doing the same thing, we'd be wanting to be a part of him. And you would, you would never follow to hear me preach. I'd come out here, you wouldn't be clapping. You'd be like, where's Jesus? We want to hear Jesus speak. Like, that's the kind of stuff that we would be doing. If we had Jesus around, we would be doing the same thing. We would be following him. We'd be you know, taking vacation days off of work just to hear him speak. We'd be leaving and traveling anywhere we could to hear this guy speak. 
because he spoke so well and he spoke with compassion and he told good stories and he healed people and Jesus, he was just pretty great. (laughs) And so he tries to find this secluded place. He tries to go off by himself and it doesn't work. 5,000 plus people swarm on him and he looks at them and he has compassion on them. And so he starts healing them and talking with them and preaching and ministering with them. And then he turns to his disciples and he says, all right guys, they're all hungry. Let's find them something to eat. And the disciples are like, there's no way. We won't have enough money to buy enough food for all these people. Why don't you just send them home and let them go? Then you could have the downtime you wanted. Jesus, this is the perfect moment to say, we're closed, go home, get something to eat, we'll see you in a week or so. This is the time to take vacation, Jesus. And we don't have enough money anyway. (laughs) And so Jesus says, well, you got to figure this out. And the disciples, they finally, they, they, they kind of work amongst themselves, and they're like, all right, all we have is this little boy who's got some food. This little boy has a little lunch of some bread and some fish. That's all we have, Jesus. And in my mind, I don't think that they brought this to him as a, oh, I have faith that you're going to do something great with this. I think they brought this to him as the excuse of, look how little we have. Send them home. In some ways, I think that might have been playing in their mind. I know it would have been if it was me. I'd be like, look, this is how little we have. We don't have enough. You've got to send them away. Don't make them promises that we're going to feed them. And Jesus takes this food, and he stops, and he gives thanks. And he breaks it, and there's enough for everybody to eat. And then there's enough that there's like tons of leftovers. And it's crazy cool. And we're pretty good at this. I would say that in general, those of us involved in church, we're pretty good at stopping and praying over our food. Our basic needs are met. We do a decent job of us just stopping and saying grace. If you're a Christmas movie fan, maybe you watched National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation this year, and they're about to eat dinner, and they say to the old lady, they say, all right, it's time to say grace. They want you to say grace. And she said, grace died 30 years ago. They're like, no, the blessing. And then she, like, pledge allegiance to the flag or something. It's great fun, you know. <laughs> um, but we're pretty good. Generally, we're, just, we're pretty good at saying grace. But what I want us to learn from Jesus is that this is deeper than just thanking God for some food. This isn't just, okay, I have food on my plate and I say, thank you God, let this nourish me and give me strength. That's as much as I want to say because I'm really hungry. I've actually heard people say that they don't like to pray until after they eat because they want to make sure they're thankful for the food they ate. They're like, I want to make sure this tastes good before I actually thank God for it because maybe, you know, maybe mom's casserole is not worth thanking God for. I just want, you know, maybe that's the case. I don't know. I've heard people actually use that as an argument. Whatever. This story, though, goes deeper than that. If you look at the context of this story, right before this happens, Matthew tells us that John the Baptist was just beheaded. And Jesus hears this, and that's why he was seeking solitude. John the Baptist is just killed, and Jesus wants to be alone, and 5,000 plus people come on him, and they want him to minister to him. Have you ever been at that moment where you're tired, You're exhausted. You have nothing left to give. And your boss wants you to stay an extra hour. Your kids want you to spend a little bit more time with them. Your kids don't sleep through the night. You get home from work and you're exhausted. You've got nothing left to give and dinner needs to be made. Dishes need to be washed. Laundry needs to be done. The car needs gas. The car needs oil. You know what I'm talking about. You're exhausted. All these people come to Jesus at that moment. He just found out John the Baptist died. He's sorrowful. Like this is this is a deep moment for him. This is sad moment for him. And he wants to just be alone. He wants me time, you know? He wants to process what he just heard, what just happened. He goes and seeks out alone time and he doesn't get it. All these people come at him. And it would be very easy for any of us to go, go away. Please go away. And he has compassion on them and he ministers to them and he heals them and he 
talks with them. And then he decides to feed them. The disciples try to give him an out, and they're like, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough food, we can't do this. They give him an out, they give him an opportunity to have me time, the Jesus time, to just be by yourself. And he doesn't even take it then, does he? And then he stops in the midst of all that. In the midst of craziness. In the midst of loss. In the midst of being crazy busy with so many people and their needs and meeting them and just putting on the game face, you know? That's when he stops everything and gives thanks. And just says, God, thank you for providing for our basic needs. That's a pretty good moment. That's a pretty awesome moment from Jesus. In the midst of all that craziness, he puts on the face and he's like, no, we're going to still keep the main thing the main thing. We stop now and give thanks for the basic needs being met. The next story I want to tell you is from John chapter 11. Again, if you want to turn there and keep it open or if you just want to make that a mental note for later, this is another pretty well-known story. It's another death. Jesus is close to a few people and Jesus has a friend named Lazarus and Lazarus dies. And the sad thing about this is that they send for him while he's sick. Lazarus is sick. They send for Jesus. They try to get him to come and heal him because they know he can heal him. And Jesus kind of waits and he puts it off and he doesn't go right away. And then eventually he turns to his disciples and he says, let's go visit them. And the disciples don't even want to go because where they're going to go is a dangerous area and so they don't really want to go with him. But then they're like, hey, if he's going to go and that's going to be dangerous and he's going to die, we're going to die with him. We're going to go with him. And so they go with him. They stand by his side and he goes and he meets Mary and Martha and, he, and they are bawling their eyes out because they say, you're too late. If only you came when I first sent for you, my brother would still be alive. And Jesus says, well, where is he laid? Where is he buried? And they take him to the tomb. And then he says something really weird. He says, open the tomb up. And they're like, Jesus, this is going to (laughs) stink. He's been in there a while now. You didn't come right away. Jesus, this is not a good idea. This is not proper. We don't open the tomb after we've sealed it. Jesus, this is weird. And then in the midst of that, Jesus weeps. And everyone looks at him and he says, look how much he loved him. And we know that verse. Jesus wept. Real short. We know that verse. That's the quiz, right? What's the shortest verse? Ah, oh, that spot. That was the shortest verse in the Bible. Oh, Jesus wept. We know that verse. Oh, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And it's in this moment that that happens. This is a deep moment with Jesus as well. Just like the first one, John the Baptist died and he wants solitude. This is a similar moment. He's here. His friend has passed away and he weeps. And they notice it. And then, this is where I do want to read this because this is just really cool. He stops to give thanks before he does anything. He's Jesus. He knows this guy's coming back from the dead, right? (laughs) I mean, he's Jesus. He knows he's all-powerful. He knows he's the Son of God. He knows he can do great things. And he stops here in the middle of his grief, in the middle of his weeping. He stops here and he says, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know that you've always heard me. And I say this for their benefit so that they know that you hear me. Hmm. And then Lazarus is brought back from the dead, which is pretty awesome. And if you've ever heard this story before, that's what gets preached on. But what I want to talk about is that phrase, God, thank you for hearing me. Because in the midst of this, in the midst of a death, it's really easy to get mad at God. I, I would venture to say most people who just walk away or get frustrated with God or end up yelling at God, it's a moment where somebody they loved has died and they don't understand why that person had to die. Do you agree with me? That happens. Even if you're a devoted Christ follower, someone you love dies and you go, why now? Why now? Did, did, why? Why? And we don't understand it. We can't wrap our head around it. And Jesus, the Son of God, stops here in the midst of that. And He says, God, thank You for hearing me. As someone who served in ministry, I've spent lots of time in hospitals by someone's bed praying for healing. And unfortunately, a lot of those 
the healing never came. And the family asks, why? Why? And as a human, I have, I have no answer for them. I mean, we can butter it up as best we can. We can try to say, oh, well, you know, all God's plans, all God's purposes. We say all those churchy things to try to make somebody feel better. And ultimately, those things don't do anything any justice. I mean, I have a brother who passed away of leukemia. I would give anything to have him back. I'd give anything to have my brother Kenny back, to have Jesus come and say, all right, Kenny, come on out. Of course, that was 16 years ago. I'd be saying the same thing. Don't open that grave. That's bad. But at the same time, I'd give anything to have my brother come back. And I imagine Mary and Martha sitting there and being a part of that. And before the miracle even happens, Jesus stops and thanks God for listening to him. And that's what I want you to hear today when this story is that in the midst of sadness and sorrow, if the miracle you're praying for never happens, do you still have the faith and strength to stop and say, God, thank you for hearing me? In 2016, if you want it to be a really good year, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of anything happening, if you don't even know that the miracle that you're praying for is going to happen, you just don't even know, and it's not even here yet, and it hasn't even happened yet, and nothing has gone the way you wanted it to go, do you still have the faith and courage and strength in your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to say, God, thank you for hearing me, because I do know that you hear me. Because that by itself is a huge blessing. We have a God that sees us, that hears us, that listens to us, He doesn't answer us the way we thought He should all the time, but He always hears us. And Jesus teaches us that here. Even if the miracle doesn't happen, Jesus says, thank you God for hearing me. And I'll tell you, that is hard. That first one is kind of easier for us. We kind of wrap our heads around that. We're like, okay, our basic needs are met. We can say, God, thank you for this food. Our basic needs are met. Even in the midst of turmoil, sometimes we'll stop, even if our prayer is short, and we'll say, God, thank you for this. But it gets a little harder when our prayers we don't feel like are being answered. Are you still willing to say, God, thank you for hearing me? Because at this moment, the miracle hasn't happened. We don't know that Lazarus is coming back from the dead, and that's where Jesus shows us a time to be thankful. A time to be thankful is just to be able to say, God, I appreciate that you listen. If nothing else, you at least listen. The next story is from Mark chapter 14. And this one's really cool because we just celebrated this one. This is the Last Supper. This is that communion we just had together. And this story is really neat because we have Jesus reclining at the table with his disciples And he knows what's coming next. Do you understand that Jesus has now already asked God, if it's it's at all possible, please take this cup from me. Please, if anything else could happen to make salvation come without me having to die, make it happen, but your will be done, not my own. This is the turmoil that's going on in Jesus. This is Jesus' inner monologue is God, if there's any other way to bring salvation to the world other than what I am about to go through, please make it happen. So he's sitting with his disciples with that in his mind. Do you understand that kind of sorrow and sadness? And he's sitting with his disciples and he's breaking bread with them and they're talking and hanging out and he stops and he takes the bread and he breaks it and he gives thanks. It's easy to miss this word and phrase because we've seen it in each of these three stories. He stops and gives thanks. That's all we're told. It's not some elaborate like prayer. He doesn't stand there and like this 30-minute prayer of thanks. And if he does, the writers of the Bible don't even think it's important enough to tell us that. They just tell us he gives thanks. It doesn't matter how short or long or poetic it is. He gives thanks. And so he stops here and he gives thanks. He breaks the bread, he gives thanks. He gives it to the disciples, telling them, this is my body broken for you. And I imagine this next part really weighing heavy on him. Because these first two, we see him stop and give thanks once. This time, in the midst of this turmoil, he stops and gives thanks a second time. You know this is weighing on him. 
if he's going to stop twice to make sure he gives thanks. So he breaks the bread, he gives thanks, and then he breaks, and then he grabs the cup, and he gives thanks over the cup, and he passes it to his disciples, explaining, this is my blood poured out for you. Do you understand that the people he just broke bread with, the people he just passed this cup to, one of them is about to betray him, and he calls them out on it. He's sitting with his betrayer. He's sitting with his betrayer. He's thinking of the suffering that's about to happen. He's thinking in his head, God, if there's any other way to make this happen other than what's about to happen, that would be awesome. All this stuff is going on in his head. And he stops to give thanks to God. When you're sitting with people you don't like, is it easy for you to stop and give thanks to God? When you're sitting with people who were just completely rude to you, you, oh, come, you were just spending time with family for Christmas and Thanksgiving. This has happened to you in the last week. I'm, I guarantee it. You've sat with someone who has said something rude to you, and your immediate thought is, I just want to eat, get through this meal, and get home with my dignity intact. You're not thinking about giving thanks to God. You're thinking about getting out of the room. <laughs> That's all you're thinking about. And I, I, that's all I was thinking about, all right? This is, uh, this is close to home with me. I have family too. Come on, man. Jesus is in the midst of what is going to be the worst suffering anyone has ever endured. He is looking to that as the future, knowing that salvation comes from what He's about to go through. Knowing that salvation is going to come to the person, all right, who's about to betray him, that is an option for him. The guy who's going to betray him now has the option of salvation because what he's about to do, like, all of this is in your head. This is a big moment. That option of salvation is for everyone and all these people that have, that have sinned against God. He's about to die for. He didn't sin, and he's about to die for it all. And he stops and gives thanks. A lot of times when I'm going on in a circumstance that's tough, I sit there and go, God, why am I in this circumstance? Why am I in this position? Why is this going on right now? Why is this happening to me? And the last thing on my mind is thanking God for any opportunity I have in the midst of that. But Jesus shows us a different way. Jesus shows us that in the midst of that turmoil, that's when you do stop. And then when your brain starts to wander again, you better stop again and thank God for what's there and thank God for the big picture because if Jesus doesn't go through with this, what happens to us? And Jesus stops and gives thanks. Partly not even on His behalf, but on our behalf. That this is going to bring people close to Him. This is going to reconcile people with us and our Father. And Jesus stops and gives thanks for that. <laughs> right before He goes into this entire thing that's going to destroy Him physically, He stops and gives thanks for it. That is crazy to me. I in no way feel like I have this figured out because I don't. But I have one small story of when I felt like I at least came close to this. We waited six years for our son to come. It was a long time, thinking we wouldn't get pregnant and thinking that that would never happen for us, and it was trying on us. A lot of times over the years, it got really hard to, to watch other people get what we wanted and maybe not even want it themselves. There's a lot of pain, a lot of anguish over that time of just desiring something deeply and it just not happening, and then having doctors tell us, well, you know, there's, you guys probably just aren't a good match. And you're like, wait, <laughs> you know, we felt like we were a good match. God, we felt like God brought us together and you're just a person telling us we're not fit to be together. Like, that's the kind of stuff we were told. And when he came along, it was amazing. When we got to announce that we were pregnant, it was so exciting. And then time came, like, go time, you know, go into the hospital. The go time, that excitement, man, the bag was packed, we were ready to go, we're at the hospital, we're in the parking lot, we're there, we're on point. And we get there and they start throwing around words that are scary about high blood pressure and preeclampsia and scary stuff. And they're, 
we wanted an all-natural birth, and they're talking about C-sections, and we're like, wait, what? What's happening? And it's like that spiral, and that all happens so fast. Have you ever seen, like, Monsters, Inc., where, uh, <laughs> where Stully is standing in front of that clear glass, and he thinks, his, thinks Boo is caught in the trash compactor? And he's like fainting. That was me standing outside the OR. I'm like looking at him. Uh, like, like every time I look in and they're like flopping my wife around. I'm like, oh my God. And like all this stuff is happening. And then like everything was fine. We, we heard him cry and we're like, oh man, that's our baby crying. This is crazy cool. And his name is Lucian Everett Fisher, which means a light that is strong. And it's just He's been such a light, and all this stuff, and it's so exciting for us, because in the midst of a really dark time, all of a sudden, we have this light in front of us, and it was really great, and he was with us for a few minutes, and then they said he had to go to the NICU. We're like, wait, the NICU? Wait, why? I mean, the week went on, and he was in the NICU for a full 10, 11 days. They all blend together. (laughs) And thankfully, I had enough vacation. I was able to stay and we, we stayed in the room with him all the time at that, at that NICU. And we were there holding vigil with him. And this was the closest I felt that I came to what Jesus... Like I said, I, I in no way feel like I figured this out, but this was the closest I felt to coming to this, was that moment where no matter what happens, I'm going to give thanks to God for what we have right now. My wife and I were walking through the halls of the hospital one day, and we looked at each other and we said, you know what? If we only get him for a week, he's going to have an awesome week. And we're going to love him for a week. Is he 15 months old now, 14 and a half months old? And he's fine. You would never know he was in the NICU for a week. Never know. But at that moment, we didn't know. We didn't know that he'd be okay. We actually, that we felt like the doctors didn't give us any good info. We just didn't know. Those are the moments that Jesus shows us when we need to be thankful. Because even if the miracle doesn't happen, are you still willing to stand there and thank God for hearing you? Even in the midst of turmoil and sadness and crazy stress, are you willing to say, God, thank you for the big picture. I I don't see the big picture. I don't understand the big picture. I don't know what your plan is for the future. But God, thank you for taking care of the big picture because in my short-sighted mind, I wouldn't be able to handle it. Do we have that kind of strength to, in the midst of turmoil, be able to thank God for our basic needs being met? In the midst of sorrow and sadness and a miracle that may never happen, are we willing to say, God, thank you for hearing me? And then over here, in the midst of complete stress and turmoil, are we willing to stop multiple times to make sure we thank God for the big picture? If you want 2016 to be a great year, this is a good place to start. In the midst of whatever you're going through, stop and give thanks. It doesn't have to be complicated. Don't overthink it. Each of these phrases, it just says, he stopped and gave thanks. He gave thanks. He gave thanks. It doesn't say he wrote a sonnet of how grateful he was. It doesn't say that he wrote a ten-volume book about how awesome and thankful he was. It said he stopped and gave thanks. He gave thanks. He gave thanks. 2016, stop and give thanks. I'm going to ask the band to come up as I pray for us and lead us into a time of you know, invitation and thought, thinking and processing. And I, just, I challenge you, if, you've, if you're somebody that's, that's never accepted Christ, man, he's got some awesome stuff for you. And I challenge you to accept him. If you're somebody who has accepted Christ, and He is your Lord and Savior, stop and give thanks to Him because He's awesome. Let's pray. God, we come before You and we thank You. I'm going to practice what I preach and I'm going to keep it simple. Thank You. Thank You for Your Son. Thank You for filling our needs. Thank You for taking care of the big picture. And most of all, thank You for hearing us. In your name I pray.